Good afternoon there, Stephen Murray. Thank you so much today for joining me as a guest on the Ridiculously Human podcast, bud. Yeah, good afternoon. So good to be here. I'm very honored to be uh, one of your guests, considering the, the run of guests that you've had but previously. This is a, really is a big honor for me. <laughs> and bud, you've, uh, you've whitened your teeth for me today as well. I'm like, yes, yeah, see, check those like, you know, shiny, bright white teeth you've got there. Thanks, man. I know where since you uh, you've gone into video now, I'm making sure that you are covering both bases. I wanted to make sure that at least your guests have something pretty to look at. <laughs> well, but looking at you, you, you are you're a good looking man. So so you cover that quite easily. But um yeah, we are both actually testing out kind of uh, new equipment uh, in our like podcast studios slash offices. And um yeah, it's quite a it's quite a thing, isn't it? Like producing a podcast and, and doing it properly. Like there, there's so many kind of dynamics to it and you want to make it like as exciting as possible, not just like a zoom call. I mean, I'm totally guilty of that because up until now, after 134 episodes, I've only done like zoom, zoom. And, and you were like, cool, I'm going to try test my video out. And I'm like, okay, cool. That's awesome. You know, I want to try test another like video angle out. So, so yeah, thanks for putting in like such a big effort, but it's going to be great to, to put this podcast together. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I think um, yeah, you've sent me down this rabbit hole, so actually it's mostly your fault. Um, but it is it is like that. You you start to see the scope of these things, and you lay the first foundation of, okay, I'm going to start a podcast, and then you go a little bit deeper. You're like, okay, well, there's this new element to it, and it starts like it's quite technical in the beginning, and then you look for ways to sort of optimize that. How can I do this more efficiently? And then it, like it really branches out. There. Like, how am I communicating? What are my communication channels? It really becomes a very big scope. So, um, yeah, I think that the one thing that I've learned is that I, I did like some overinvest technically initially in equipment. And now I'm realizing, like, okay, what do I really need to make it uh, successful? But it's, uh, yeah, it's all a work in progress. Everything's a work in progress. Yeah, that we know that that kind of never stops. Say, it's like, the day you're 99, it's still kind of like, you know, 99 years old, it's still like work in progress, isn't it? Life is just this constant evolution, which is lacquer. I mean, I love that about life is like, you know, people like us that are, are generally, I guess, more growth minded. That's, that's kind of what we're always looking at. Okay, cool. What's, what else is there? How can I improve? And it's a, it makes life more exciting, I think. Yeah, I think that you, um, you're constantly looking to build new platforms of how you can go from there, right? So, each brick is something that you create yourself and then you place that brick and then you've got to place that brick as a step towards something else. And I think that the minute you start making the bricks, you, you kind of stagnate and you can get frustrated. So we don't spend a lot of time looking back at what we've built. We, we kind of like just really just focusing on the next brick. So that for me is just always been um, like a staple. And I think that personal development is something that I've always prioritized over money or over relationships. I'm like, what will opportunity present in terms of how much I can learn and how will that then catapult me into the next thing? And often that's led to much bigger opportunities and much bigger success in whatever I'm doing. And yeah, so maybe financially it doesn't pay out initially, but I think in the, in the end it does actually all come back to you. Yeah. You're like playing the long game there. Yeah, and, and the long game is consistency. It's not it's not quick wins. And I think um I, I've had to I've had to remind myself of that a lot. Like whether it's a new gym program where you're like, you know, I used to go in and not be able to get to gym every day, but the day that I did go, I'd go and smash four hours, you know, like, oh, I'd smash three hours, or I'd do a 30 minute that would actually kill me. Like how many calories could I smash in 30 minutes? And that's not it's not constructive. It just burns you out. So I think that it is consistent, long game, small steps, and that incrementally leads you to where you need to be. Yeah, absolutely, bud. Um, I was hoping that you were going to bring out some analogies because I always reckon you have like the best analogies. Like, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking with each other and then you, you'll come up with these and I'll be like, yeah, that's a good one, man. I like it. <laughs> are these, are these, do these just come naturally to you, bud? I think I'm, I'm a visual learner. So for me to be able to picture something helps me remember it and remember the lesson very well. So I wasn't very good at school. I think even, even like mathematically for me, it's a really difficult subject because the way that I do maths in my head is I literally see myself drawing the sum on a piece of paper, right? Like I'm very, very visual. So if I want to learn something, if someone shows me something once, I learn it very quickly. 
even more than that, if someone shows me visually what I'm doing, I'm able to really pick up the improvement on that. So I'm very visual. So analogies for me are a great way of storytelling to myself so that I, I'm able to remember that lesson. So, and my brain now naturally creates the picture. It naturally wants to, to build the story. And so that for me is like, I remember jokes for a very long time. Uh, don't ask me to do that now on the spot, but that just, I, I am one of those people who remembers jokes because I can remember the story of the joke, especially long jokes where there's this long roundabout journey to the punchline. Like it just, that's how my, my brain actually works. And so when I'm trying to motivate salespeople or whether I'm trying to push a point across, I find it very easy to come across with a really good analogy that helps people get the, get the message rather than me trying to convey it in, uh, in uh, this, I suppose, specific words. I think if you can get like storytelling right, you know, like you, you sort of hit on those emotions and, and people can relate to it, you, you're almost guaranteed of just getting much more out of them. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Like um, even when you're trying to help someone, give someone feedback, right? Like if you get them to relate to the emotion of what they're creating or what they're doing, it has much better results than getting them to just rah-rah or say yes, yes in the meeting. Like if you say like, how would this make you feel? And imagine this, imagine you're sitting in your house one day with your kids around you and you're financially stable and how good that feels, you know, to crack a beer in your own house when you're not worried about the bills every single day. And I think that when you create that story for them, they relate to the story and then they want that story for themselves. And I'm from a very young age, we tell stories or we hear stories and they stick with us. Like you remember your childhood stories are, I'm, you know, fortunate enough to tell my kids stories every night. And my daughter prefers the stories I tell her than the, the ones that I read. So I always ask her, do you want me to read you a story or tell you a story? And she's always like, no, you must tell me a story. And they develop and you, they, they want to participate. And you can see the eyes getting big. And I think it starts from a very young age for us. So if you become a good storyteller later on, you're able to really move people in the direction you want to move them. And uh, what is your daughter's uh, favorite story so far that you, you saw there? So there's always a theme where she is involved and she is a princess and there's generally a dragon and the dragon ends up being her friend at the end. So the dragon comes and causes a lot of trouble. That's the general plot line is dragon comes, causes a lot of trouble. She goes out to speak to the dragon. Then the dragon realizes that he's actually lonely or there's another problem. And so she then helps the dragon find his family or his food or whatnot. And then it solves so that for her, it's always about like, you know, like she doesn't like it when it finishes bad for everyone. She doesn't like it when there's a real baddie, the baddie should always come around to being a goodie at the end. Like, so I think that that for her is always something I, I've noticed where I've left some cliffhangers where it's like really quite a bad issue, like not very comfortable. And then I have to just go back and close the story that everyone's friends in the end, you know? Oh, that's classic, but that's classic. Um, it reminds me of you, you, like you're talking about princesses, but like one of your favorite books is, is the little prince, um, yeah. which is like an all time classic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I love that book. Um, I think it has a lot of adult content. It's very hard actually for kids to, to get, I think. Um, it has some sentimental attachment for me. I think the first thing is like, it was given to me as a gift by someone. And they told me that a lot of the, the behavior of the prince was very similar to me or the way that he sees the world. And um, I, I never heard of it before. And so I went and I read it and I just, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the language. I fell in love with the innocence of it in the way it deconstructed complex adult relationships with money or with tasks. And it created a very simple way of looking at those things. And I think that that's often something we forget to do. We like to build complexity into a lot of things instead of like stripping out the, the chaos that we create for ourselves and really just looking at the base of the problem. I'm working too hard. I'm valuing the wrong things. I'm not making enough time for myself. I'm not making enough time for my family. You know, like there's all these other reasons, but when you break it down, it's just, you're not doing like the basics, right? I love it when it's like a, or it's meant to be like a sort of children's story, but actually you almost take more from it as, as like an adult. Um, my wife and I, we read every night to Maya uh, when we we're putting her to sleep and we just read the book called wonder 
uh, there's a movie made about it as well. So it's a little boy, Aggie, and he has like a, a deformed face essentially. And um, wow, honestly, it was such an amazing read. Like we watched the movie, but the read was so good. And like the last couple of chapters, we both like bawling our eyes out just reading the story to her. And it's like, I think this book was more for us than it was for her. <laughs> But I think that's all stories. They they're actually um they're all for us, right? Like they they I think animation gives you the illusion that it's for children, but it's actually everything that you read and the plot lines always stay the same. So whether it's a kid's book or whether it's an adult fiction, you find or even if it's human tragedy, we follow the same patterns on things like and I think that that's why it's very easy for us to relate to children's stories because you get to the essence of it very quickly. Like there's no complex language getting you to the essence of what is being said or what is being felt. And I think that that there's a lot from children's books. And I think I'm, I'm the ultimate adult kid. I still love to play. I love toy stores. I love being on all fours with my kids and just getting on their level. Like, I think there's just like, it's a great way to connect with the world I love driving my kids to school and just like stopping and really paying attention to what we're seeing. You know, like, the, you know, you remind yourself that my daughter doesn't know what a Bougainvillea is and why is this one pink and why is this one orange, you know, and, and they're paying attention to the world in like completely new ways, but it's so refreshing to step back from it and think about these things. And so, you know, we get caught on like our phone or like on our general commute and we drive the same routes every single place that we go and we have these automatic filters that are filtering out a lot of the wonder of the world but kids don't haven't built those filters yet so then they remind you to sort of check in and then if you can just bring some of that daily behavior back you feel you feel great like you know like you jump on a scooter on the way to work like we've got these electric scooters here in Lisbon and you cruise down and you're like oh this is a really beautiful city and then you look at the buildings like it's stop and like take it in. And I think that that's something to remove the filters in our lives is like a really critical thing to do. And kids can teach us to do that. And so can their books. Yeah. Kids can, can definitely teach us a lot. Eh? Um, you know, my has been like the biggest reminder for me about actually how much I, I used to love playing, you know, and like playing in water and, and making mud and just like, Oh man, seeing the world through their eyes is literally the best thing ever for for an adult after like years and years of almost like programming and losing kind of your curiosity a little bit and your playfulness and it's like okay cool now she's reminding me who i actually am and i'm going to be that person again yeah and i think that that's a it's just in the relationships that you have with people like they get they get heavy over time they get heavy with competition like how you did after school or you know like who made the first team or whatever it is, like, as you get older, your adult relationships get really complex. But my kids have reminded me how valuable the relationship with my brother and my cousins were, you know, like how we used to play all the time and how much, how much we used to appreciate each other. And then all the old jokes. And I often find myself after playing with my kids or watching them play with each other with their cousins, sending a message to my cousin or my brother saying, do you remember when we did this thing? Like, like, that's the thing. And I think that it it really does let you become young again and let your mind plug back into your youth. It reminds me, my cousin, he's about three years older than me, uh, Justin, and his his sister Natalie, obviously also my cousin. They're a few there, she's and she's even older than than that. Um, but they they were like <laughs> they used to they used to say to me, Gareth, what is that on your face? And I'll be like, What are you talking about? They're like, it's Kaki Loris. I'm like, what, what, what's Kaki Loris? And it was just this like total made up thing. You know what I mean? And I had to remind them recently because we started like this, this family zoom, like during COVID and stuff and uh, everyone around the world would phone in and stuff. And then we were just reminding each other about stories and, and that one came up and I was like, Oh yeah, I remember you guys were quite big bullies actually used to, used to get me scared about Kaki Loris on my face. <laughs> and we had a good laugh about that, but <laughs> yeah, so funny. That's awesome. Yeah. So, but, um, you have this really awesome concept uh, called um, authentically unprofessional. Can you just tell me more about it, please? Yeah, so um, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually. And, you know, I think that through the coaching and, you know, the program that we did is um, what kind of happens to us when we start our 
professional pursuit of life, like how we make money and your first job that you go into, you suddenly create this persona, you create this professional persona that you have to be. And it's not, it's not an authentic version of yourself. And it lets us play a completely different game. And, um, but I find my biggest success is when I've been unprofessional or more authentic, where I've been in the room when I've been drinking with my peers or my executive group and like a little bit more loose or telling the jokes I really want to tell or uh, putting, putting myself forward in the way that I really want to put myself forward. And so that for me is about what authentic unprofessional is like saying, just disconnect from, from the drama and the nonsense and the corporate ladder and disconnect from the way that you're supposed to be and what, you know, the, the, the professional playbook is telling you to be because it's not authentic and it's not going to serve you well. And it stopped me from being a nice guy. Like for me, like the thing that served me the best in my life is being an incredibly nice guy, being really kind to other people and being very considerate. And that served me better than climbing the corporate ladder or trying to sort of find an angle over my peers or trying to sort of get ahead. And now I play the game that says, okay, what does collaboration feel like? If I'm in the room, I speak my mind. I'm not worried about the, the potential persecution of what it's going to look like if I don't say the right thing or if I, I'm not exactly a culture fit or if I don't, you know, sort of step up to things. And I think that that's what I'm trying to get to with Authentic Unprofessional is that just be yourself. Go after the opportunity, speak your mind. If the room doesn't, if the room rejects you, but you still feel that and you don't buy into what the room is saying, it's not the right room. And you need to find the right room. And you need to start putting yourself there out in that way so that you can find happiness because you don't want to be, you know, later on in life sitting in the wrong room, the wrong room of people, the wrong company, the wrong values, the wrong sort of things, um, sort of priorities in your life. And then you take a step back and you realize like, geez, I'm really not happy. I don't get up feeling motivated to go to work. I'm not living the day that I want to live. I'm not uh, connecting in with my family at the end of the day because I'm always stressed and I'm always tired. And so that's the essence of what I'm trying to get back to just, you know, just by being yourself and being authentic and stop trying to be the professional, you're going to end up in the right rooms anyway. Do you think that this is something you can do like early on in your career, you know, like rather than kind of play that sort of corporate game um, or, or do you have to, is it like a, a little bit of both, you know, you, you can be genuine, but you have to play the game to get kind of where you want to get, because now you, you're saying this as a guy that's like done really well, you know, and you know, you run your own businesses and, and these sort of things. So, so you kind of have, you, you, you've got into this position where you can be like that. Um, yeah. Do you think you, you can do it your whole career or, yeah, I think that you can. I think the the first thing to learn to do well is to ask questions respectfully. So how you interrogate the information that is coming into you and then how you respond back to that. I think you have to be clear on who you are and what you want. So even in your first job, you should be asking yourself, well, who are the mentors in this room? What are they going to be giving me? And other than the paycheck every single month, where is this going? Like what platform will this create for me? And those become like sort of your base values in that space. And the minute that you feel that those values are being corrupted or taken away, um, that's, the, that's when you start to have hard questions or ask hard questions of the company. Maybe they forgot too. Maybe your bosses have forgotten or you know, the mentors that you've chosen have forgotten about those values. And then you can sync up on them and you can, you can find a way forward. And actually that happened to me, if I'm very honest with you. Um, I was uh, working in IT. I was the senior system support engineer for um, uh, a large like uh, uh, firm, a uh, legal firm. And I'd always work with, uh, um, you know, the, the CEO. He was a difficult customer for all of the support engineers. And I would be the guy who always used to take his, his calls. So I'd be like, I'll go down and sort out his computer. Number one, he's quite cool to talk to, even though he might shit on you for 10 minutes about stuff not working, you'd get through that and you'd actually really connect with the guy. And I really appreciated that. And, um, you know, we went to a meeting one day and we were trying to sell this like a really complex predictive dialer. 
And I stood up in a meeting of like very senior execs, like the board of a bank and said, you know, this is why the predictive dialog makes, uh, saves you a lot of money. This is how much we've saved in terms of our company. And I was like 23. I was like really like a, a nobody techie in the room. And I stood up that and it put me on the map in a way. But what happened is that my relationship with the CEO started to develop and he made me some promises in terms of an opportunity at the company. And when he made those promises within a couple of days, you know, he called the whole company in and said, yeah, we're not doing raises, no changes to no changes to sort of salaries and everything's that we really like on a like cost saving, da, 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 da. the whole spiel, like they were, they were getting ready to sell the business. So they were like really just restricting in terms of what they were spending and showing better profit margins. So I went up to him and I said, hey, listen, we had this conversation and is this thing still on? And he literally said to me, like, what conversation? And for me, the trust was gone. Like, that was it. It was like, okay, well, I'm not going to sit here and argue that with you. You said this. I understood this. This is not going to work. And I left. And so, I, like, I didn't have another job. It was a bad idea, but you can something you can do when you're young. Um, I didn't have another job. I went out there. I spun off into the world. And three years later, he called me back. And he said, listen, remember that conversation that we had? I wasn't in a good position to give you that opportunity, but I am now. Would you like to join? And let's talk about what that money would look like. And for me, that was like such a good thing because we were able to then talk about it and resolve it. But it's because I, I was really authentic in that. I had my value set. I knew what I wanted to be. And I spoke my mind and asked questions in relation to that. And I was able to find my way. So I think, and that was at a very young age. So I think that it doesn't matter the age, it's just about understanding who you are and where you want to go. And yeah, that can also change. <laughs> yeah, it can definitely. Um, it's funny because one of my things I was going to ask you, I was going to say, tell me about Franz Besson. And, and that's the man, isn't it? <laughs> that's the man. Uh, and, you know, like he did a lot for me. Like he, he really, um, he was one of those mentors that pushed me. He gave me my toughest piece of, advice um that stuck with me forever and um yeah it, it it served us well we had a really good relationship and even when i left the company many years later we we parted on very good terms and what was that piece of advice so he said um i was always very ambitious and i always had these big plans about what i was going to do and um and how i was going to make money and like, that was always this thing. And he just looked at me one day and said, you know, that your drive doesn't match your ambition. And it was, it was hurtful. It was very true. But what he was saying, I know that I wasn't putting in the time and the extra time required to deliver the results that I wanted to deliver. And so working nine to five, like I was adamant that five o'clock was my gym time and I'm leaving the company now. And I was very inflexible around the additional that company might want or and thinking it was what the company wanted, but actually it was necessary for me. So it was something, and it's still, it's still one of those things that I constantly question, like, does my drive match my ambition at the moment? So it's been, um, yeah, it's been something that stuck with me. It's amazing how like someone can say literally one sentence and it can give you like something to think about almost in every moment in your life, you know? And as well as that sentence can almost like change the trajectory of your life and that person. Yeah. Um, it's become the naysayer voice. I think I've adopted it as my voice. So you have to just be careful about that stuff because it could have just been a passing comment to him, but because his opinion mattered a lot to me, it's become a, a staple in, inside of me. So that's uh, something to constantly remind myself or to check in on. Um, but yeah, it does. It can be a catalyst for you, providing you, you are open enough to receive feedback, that you don't close off from feedback, that you say, you can look at it and say, is that true? Is that, is that actually a true statement? And in that moment, I was really angry. I remember how angry I was. I was like, I wanted to be his champion. Like I wanted to be a lot to him. You know, I, I, I constantly like jostling to be like, you know, the, the, the bright eyed boy, like the, the, the gold star, you know? And, and then when he said that to me, like, Oh, he doesn't see me like that. And he's seen sort of a, a negative side of me. And then it like, it really hurt, but 
I bounced back from that and said, okay, well, now I'll go and match the drive. Mm. Yeah, that's that's cool. I it's funny how like there can be moments in our life that that define things. And and one of the stories that you told me was this awesome story about you getting lost in the trans sky. And I think it's it's one it's those moments as well that kind of like toughen us up. Can you just uh yeah, explain that story? Yeah, I was um yeah, I used to like love to do crazy stuff and just go and run, see how far I could run, or you know, we've cycled across Malawi, or we've just like always like pushed ourselves physically. And um, I was training for um a, a triathlon. It was my first Ironman, and we were down in the trans sky and I decided to go for a run. And um yeah, I, like I really backed myself in terms of I can run for days and I think I'll be fine and there's no issue. And I thought I was so fit and whatever. As long as I do it slow, I can just keep going for, for hours. It's not a big deal. And so I started this run and I ended up in like the farmlands or like a very rural trans car, like literally running in a village. I didn't know where I was. And, um, and so I thought, like, okay, well, I kind of know where the ocean is. And if I just get back to the coast and then I follow the coast back, I will end up at um, at our at our hotel, like the uh, Ungazi River bungalow. So I was like, okay, I'll just I'll make it. So then I st- I ran, and then I was like running through like these crazy like fields, like the grass. Like I was literally like running through the grass, like trying to find my way. And eventually, I came over the hill, and there was the coast. I was like, okay, cool. So I hit the coast and turn right. And as I started running, I started running out of beach, and then it became more rocks. And then I was like, okay, I'm not really running anymore. I'm kind of like, like rock hopping along the way here. And I turned around and the tide was coming in. I had like nowhere to go. So the ocean had come up and now there was like essentially like a, a cliff face in front of me and I couldn't go back because the ocean had come in. So I like, I have to climb. So I'm in running gear. I'm in like a full on tri suit and in running shoes and my, my stupid like little band with my gels and my, and my headphones playing um playing music and i'm like okay cool so i'm gonna climb up this hill this this like cliff face so i start climbing and it's wet it's raining and it, it, like i'm slipping everywhere like not in climbing gear not that i don't even know how to climb but i'm like okay cool climbing and then i hit this overhang and i realized like okay i have to go left and i started climbing left across this thing and then i went through these stinging nettles and i'm hanging onto the side of this wet black cliff with the ocean below me stinging nettles like killing my forearms. <laughs> like, okay, cool. And I found this other crazy route. And eventually, eventually, I don't know how I didn't die, but I got to the top of this cliff and I'm standing on the top of this cliff and the wind is just like howling. It's like, it's like the craziest day. This cold like water spitting in my face. And I just stood on the top of the mountain, just like completely screaming. And I was just like so pumped that I didn't die, but so pumped that I like, I pushed through this thing. And, uh, and then I managed to find my way back down to, you know, the beach and ran the way home. And I got home like after dark, after dinner, like everyone's like, where were you? And I, I couldn't actually explain the story to everyone, like what had just happened. And then the realization that actually, if I did, if I did some, if I did die or something happened to me, no one would know where I was because I just ran off into like rural trans sky. Like no one would know where to even start looking for me. So it was like, this is another thing of like remembering to check in with your family or to have some sort of base of support. Like I, I tended to be these independent, crazy things, but it was a, it was a good time. <laughs> it's so funny. Like how many times in our life where like things could go seriously wrong, you know, I think a lot of the time it's when you you're young and you've had like way too much to drink and you're normally drunk and you like wake up in the morning. You're like, yeah, see, how did we get away with that? <laughs> but this is one of those stories where you, you're kind of actually sober <laughs> and you're like, yes, I don't know how I survived that. I was super lucky. Yeah. I think that you always have to back yourself, right? Like you have to believe in yourself. When I started that run, I completely had faith in myself that no matter how far the run is, if I just do it slower, I will be okay. You're like, I think that that's kind of like the basic logic that I have for myself. It's like, it can go bad, but logically it'll probably end up over here like that's kind of the route that it would go and i think that i generally operate like that in a lot of things like it could go bad there's a probability it will go bad 
Um, but if it does go bad, like kind of this is how we'll handle it. I didn't expect to climb a cliff and have to like fight for my life, but like you don't know that it can go that bad, but you do have a sense of backing yourself to say, well, I'll figure it out. Like it doesn't matter what it is. I'm going to figure it out. And, and I often find like if I'm procrastinating on something it's because I haven't stopped to say, it doesn't matter. Just start. You will figure it out. Like, it's like stuff that you don't understand. You're being pushed in a, in a new pressure on a new deadline. It's okay. You you will figure it out. And and you have to start with that first brick that we spoke about. You have to start doing it. And then you, eventually you will figure it out. And even if you can't figure it out, you'll ask someone who might give you like kind of that missing piece and then you will carry on figuring it out. But for the most part, we don't live in a world where you can be eaten or, you know, or, you know, sort of tribal tribes can come and kill you. So, there's very little risk to a lot of the decisions that you make. And for the most part, you can figure them out. Um, and yeah, that's just, I think, how I carry myself. Have you always backed yourself or, and, and like been a confident person or has it something, is it something that's sort of grown in you or something that happened to you to make you see yourself different in life? So my behavior has always been there, but I didn't always believe in myself. So I, I and it sounds weird, but I'm only starting to acknowledge that in myself now. And um, that's part of some, of some deep work that you and I have done in terms of looking at myself and looking back at my younger self and then acknowledging things that I did that were quite hard. Like you tend to be very hard on yourself or see yourself in a different way and you don't give yourself the credit that you deserve. So I've always had the confidence to go out and do uncomfortable things or to talk to strangers or to, you know, push myself in very uncomfortable situations or what most people would find uncomfortable. That confidence has been there, but I haven't acknowledged it. I didn't realize that it was a thing. So I'd focus on the negatives of who I was and, you know, a couple failed attempts at things and like really beat myself up on like, you know, the minority events rather than the majority of the attributes that have been carrying me so far. So it really has been, and it's been this year, like that mostly that I'm looking back and saying, actually, you have had this DNA, you do do these things and you need to back yourself more or acknowledge that you back yourself. And so that's been a, a very big mindset shift that I've had over the last 12 months. It's so weird. Like you look from the outside, you know, and you, and you see a guy like yourself, who's like achieving a lot, who's done a lot, who's lived in a lot of places and who just like seems totally fearless. Uh, but that's not like, it's not always the case, is it? You know, sometimes it's, it's almost like a mask for people. Um, it's how they actually manage like their insecurities. Um, and it's, uh, it's just re humans are just so interesting. Like I, I think, um, yeah, you kind of never know what's sort of under that iceberg really, do you? Yeah, you don't. I think we all very, we become very good at coping. And um, the older you get, the more you build sort of like coping mechanisms that you don't necessarily appreciate might be holding you back or what come across as like massive sort of like confidence attributes like, oh, that guy's so confident. He goes out and he speaks to everybody and he's always the life of the party and whatever, you know, like that, that used to be my persona. Like that's, oh, he is that person, but actually I'm exhausted by the end of that. And what I really like doing is staying at home and tinkering around the house and doing stuff like that. And that actually like really um, energizes me or going out and doing a triathlon or spending hours on a bike by myself is like really very rewarding and energy filling for me. And being the life of the party is incre incredibly exhausting. But because that one was the most socially accepted, that was the one that I carried on doing and it wasn't necessarily the best thing for me. So I am, um, we do this, like we, we find something that like kind of is a good social fit and it creates a mask and it lets us sort of like grease into the, into the social circle. And then we like reinforce that. But then the expectation from everyone else is like that. They want you to be more like that because they really like have a bucket for you now. And, um, I've only been able to really shed the bucket since moving overseas, like the bucket of what people think I am versus who I really am. And, and that's, that been something about like creating completely new networks or social circles for myself has really helped me sort of change my persona. I've done some really interesting work with uh, one of our other friends, Ryan Hall, who was on the podcast not too long ago. And um, 
it's this um, called this disc assessment by John Maxwell. And it, it talks about the different types of personalities that we have. We have like almost this private personality, which is the one you're speaking about now, like at home and you like, you know, you like tinkering around and, or you like doing a triathlon, whatever. Then you have your public personality or, or I guess persona, which is, you know, the Steve that's out there and he's like the life of the party and, you know, chatting to everybody and stuff. And then you also have the, your, your third one, which is the under pressure Steve, you know, and we, and we all actually have these different personalities we, we might not even realize it or we might just go no i'm actually the same person all the time but no no you're actually not <laughs> you have these we all have these and um it was like such an interesting process to go through and um i mean you just explained it there exactly you know it's just it's just like we all actually have these different personalities yeah and you have to practice them i know it sounds weird but I realized from COVID and lockdown and working from home, the outgoing out there Steve was completely out of practice. Like stuff that I used to do very naturally, like uh, public speaking or addressing a crowd or motivating people. Um, you know, after COVID, suddenly had to start presenting our company and looking for investors. And I was completely bad at it again. I was like, this is something that I'd really honed without really realizing it, but it was something that like I'd crafted and suddenly I, I wasn't able to read a room and I got really nervous and I was like, it was a different thing, you know? So it's like the, these other personas also need some like time in the light to thrive, right? Like, and I think that COVID was a big one, like with this lockdown that like, I think like a lot of that stuff actually broke for me. Yeah, no, that's was, I think that's, yeah, that was a big shift for, for so many people. Um, we were just talking a bit about like, fearlessness and something that i heard recently which was really interesting was that men are like literally these risk taking machines by design and that is like literally all down to like our hormones you know so men are generally like high in testosterone and that testosterone is like a daily sort of this like daily pressure like without us even realizing because for us it's normalized just to be you just take risks as a man like that's just in your dna you know what i mean and it made me think a lot i was like wow that's really interesting you know and, and it kind of like if you look at society it's like okay maybe that's why men are generally like the leaders you know because the the guys that take the risks are the people that are generally like looked at looked up upon um or looked up to um, it's maybe why guys are, you know, maybe earn more money or, but it's also why more men are in jail and more men die doing stupid things. And I was like, wow, I'd never actually thought about it on that kind of level of like what it's like to be a man that you, you actually don't even know, but you have this constant desire for risk taking because of your, your hormones. Yeah, I think. It makes sense. Um, the first piece is if you're going to have to go out and kill a mammoth, you're going to take a significant amount of risk and be willing to put yourself on the line to bring home the goods, right? So, And the more successful you were at that, the bigger risks you were able to take and the more you were able to provide for the village or for your family. So that makes a lot of sense. And I do, I do believe as much as we try to dress ourselves up, we still monkeys not far from the tree, right? Like we still are very close to our basic needs and stuff. And I think we spend a lot of time trying to dress ourselves up as more sophisticated. And then we get very confused, but like, why am I still behaving like this? I think we are still very basic creatures and we still are driven by our hormones. And I think that we try to, we try to cover that up and um, put ourselves on a sort of a higher rung than possibly we, we, we should be on. Um, you know, and I was speaking to one of my guests on, on my podcast, Rose Radford, she, and she was saying, and she helps women entrepreneurs um, because they, the one thing that they battle to do is actually, they, they, sorry, they earn still 25% less than male entrepreneurs on average. And the reason that they do it is because they don't sort of assertively put themselves out there. They don't go out and say, um, you know, Will you pay on time? Because if you say, will you pay on time? Then the response to that is that, 
uh, you're quite pushy or you're quite bitchy or whatever. So they tend to not put themselves out there on the risk of what the reputational damage will be if they assert themselves. So yeah, we, we operate we operate very differently and whether it's testosterone or whatever it is, I think, I think you know, like playing to your strengths and using that to sort of push you forward is, is not a bad idea. Um, it's just about getting the right balance. You know, like I think that what risks you take and what you put yourself out there for. Um, I think another stat is that, you know, guys are more likely, um, will more likely apply for a job that they have no business applying for. They're more likely to say, to apply for that job where it's a higher role, it's a higher sort of a salary. It's maybe they, you know, they have two years experience, but the job wants four years experience. So they're more likely to try for those things. Um, <laughs> so it serves us well, but I think we're also getting punished for it a little bit. It's interesting that you said that about um, that the guest of yours, uh, because one of the things about like masculine and feminine energies, which which both men and women have, right? Uh, generally, men have more masculine energies and traits, and generally, females have more feminine uh, energies and traits. But you know, it can also switch depending on the person. But like one of the traits uh, for for masculine energies is like direct communication. You know, which ties in exactly with what you said, because feminine energy is more indirect communication. You know, they'll they'll like subtly say something and almost expect you to kind of know what they're talking about. But actually, no, us oaks are super simple. So we're we need to be told straight, but we're also gonna tell you straight, you know, because for us that's just how we operate. And it just almost yeah. makes total sense with with what you said about her. Yeah, I, and I think yeah, just like this, even with my sales teams that I've dealt with, if I bring a sales pitch to the team in terms of going after numbers, if I say like along the lines of rah rah, let's go kill the beast. This is the target. Let's get it. We can achieve it, and it's very much like that. The the sort of the the female component of our teams doesn't respond. That's not how they don't want the target kill. Let's go and rah rah this thing. But if it's collaborative and these are the steps that we're going to take and this is the process behind getting that target and it's like really like it's almost like holistic in the communication, it, it's way more receptive. That becomes, okay, you, you, you're talking my language here. Like there's all these other elements and that you've thought very well about it and, you know, and I think that that's like it was very different like in terms of how I communicate. So like if if I did that too long, it would be, you know, like the feedback comments as leader, I'd get it's like it's very much a boys club and it's very much this. And so I've had to learn like you have to communicate in different ways to sort of get the same outcome. Um, and not everyone wants the rah rah big sales pitch, like let's go out and smash this thing. So how would you do that? Would you almost have like, okay, cool, you you go and you tell the ladies this uh, more collaborative way and then you have a separate meeting with the oaks and you're like come on let's go let's pump it <laughs> how do you do it you could do both so what we would do is we would build buy-in for what we're trying to achieve rather than this like if with guys you're like put a crazy number on the board like hey let's go kill this how are we going to kill this and then, then we all decide how we're going to sharpen our spears and do all that thing like sorry the hunting analogy but that's kind of how it was but it was okay guys we've got this big woolly mammoth that we're going to go after here and it's a big number, but let's look at this logically, like, and break it down into like bite-sized chunks and build it up this way. Then you build the belief using their input. So that was something that we did a lot to say, okay, this is a crazy number. Like, what do you think we can hit here? And then get everyone else to build their own sort of target on the, on this. And then constructively, we build up to a number that actually makes sense. In the back of my mind, I always have a number of what we think we can hit. And most people will logically come out at the same or higher number or slightly lower, which you can negotiate on later. But it became more around collaboration and so like, how do we build this thing together? So um, I couldn't just walk in with a big number and say, how do we kill it? We had to collectively build that number and it tend to have a better mix for both male and female. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and I think the more people can understand that you you need to adjust your communication in terms of who you're speaking to. Uh, the better um, because you're just going to get get the results you kind of you you're looking for because you you're speaking that person's language yeah Steve, you've been uh you've been the ceo of a business at at 32 years old kind of you know living in hong kong uh what is that 
What does that feel like at such a young age? Um, it costs a lot in terms of age. Uh, I think that uh, the initial arrogance of it was like, oh, I'm a CEO, like, look what I did. Um, regardless of how I ended up there was like a thing. I was like, oh, look, I did it and I'm so young and I'm going to be the CEO. And like the title really got to my head, but then the, <clears throat> the depth behind the title, I just didn't, I didn't have. And so it was a hard learning in terms of I went after something, I believed I could do it, but the complexity of it was above me and I had to really grind out. So when I actually came out of that role, I was pretty beat up, um, but I learned a lot. I really, you know, I learned a lot of, about um, business. I learned a lot about sort of managing people and um, I learned a lot about stress, I think. Um, so that was, that was it. So it was, a, it was a great opportunity and Hong Kong was incredible. Um, but living in a, like a major, a major city, it had much higher expectation. I'd come out from South Africa and I was like, there in this like finance capital of Asia. And I realized very quickly that charm will get you that old saying like 15 minutes of charm is like, great. But after that, you better have something interesting to say from every aspect, like going out and socializing people were owners of hedge funds and they were like high rollers and they were talking like a completely different language and they were working crazy hours and they had way better backstories and being the CEOs like of a startup that really hadn't proved itself yet, like meant nothing. It, like it, it didn't match. And so that imposter syndrome started like immediately. And then, you know, sort of grinding it out with like really big companies. We landed some really big clients and we had to sit in those meetings and like navigate like a lot of like technical stuff that wasn't really being delivered. And um, that was also pretty tough because these guys were like, they were big deals. Like, you know, if you, the largest uh, payments processor for Asia and you sold them some tech that's not working very well, like it's a very tough conversation to sit in a, in a room like that. So it was, um, it was great from a, a learning and self-reflection and experience. Like it, it, it was a platform that's changed my life, but it was a, it was a role that was actually too big for me based on my age. What did you learn about stress exactly? Um, the, well, <laughs> that I didn't manage it very well, if I'm very honest. Um, the outlets that I was creating for it was just very negative. Um, I think getting like caught up into things that weren't, uh, weren't healthy uh, in terms of how I was working and then how I was coping with the excessive work. Um, and I don't think I completely acknowledged it in the moment until I got back to South Africa. And it was, um, you know, like it didn't pan out. Like the, the, it was supposed to be that platform where we solved this thing. The tech was going to change the world. It was going to be the, like one of these scale-up stories and I was going to be a multi, multi, millionaire and that didn't happen i went back to south africa and i was living with my brother i couldn't even pay him a thousand rand rent every month it was like thank goodness he like was like really good to me um and only like years later did i realize like uh, you were in a bad way and you didn't look after yourself and what i've realized now with stress is that when i'm overly stressed the basics matter and the basics are time out sleep eating well, all the things that you tend to do when things are going really well, you, you, you know, like the, but they actually matter more when you're very stressed and, um, and you tend to get on this hamster wheel of trying to solve the problem all the time so that you actually don't address the stress. So you actually accumulate more. And so that was something that I learned. So now I know when I'm getting stressed, I know how to disconnect from the problem. I know how to zoom out. I've become more okay with stuff not working out. Um, I've, I've become okay with things failing and being able to like rebuild things, um, which was like very big learnings for me. It's so interesting to me how like, you know, we like yourself, you know, you're someone who's always sort of pushed yourself physically. You've kind of watched what you eat. I mean, you've owned a gym, you've, you've done Ironman, but then at the same time, like you said, like when you become stressed out, it's almost like you're a different person. And unless you have these sort of tools in place in terms of how to manage them, you can just really spiral out of control. And stress is like such a huge one for 
for people because they definitely behave differently. Um, but it's also the the cause of like many, many, many diseases. So yeah, stress is stress is a big one for people to kind of like put tools um, and mechanisms in place to kind of manage well. Yeah, so I tend to have high anxiety. And the way that I deal with my anxiety is I keep myself busy. <clears throat> so the more chaos there is, the more it quietens the anxiety. So I don't have to address the anxiety, but that can sometimes lead to a perfect storm. So you take on a lot. And when, the, when all of those things that you've taken on suddenly like peak together, they all need very special attention or very special output from you. <clears throat> when that happens, then you completely like bottom out. Like then you just, you, you become the worst version of yourself. And that happened to me. I was in India. I'd taken on a global role. Um, you know, the, the work was tough. We were, we, you know, we were building this unicorn. It was like prepping for its IPO. So there was a lot of pressure making sure that we hired the best people. And, um, and then I found out that I had a baby coming and now I'm living in India. And it was just like the, so silly, <laughs> but it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And I completely, you know, I, I, I spiraled and I went and I sat with the, you know, sort of with a psychologist and he was saying to me, You've got two versions of yourself. You've got anxious Steve taking on too much and <clears throat> he's doing all of this crap. And then you've got very happy, calm, stress-free Steve. Which Steve do you want making decisions for you? And it was like very clear. Obviously, you want, you want calm, stress-free Steve making good decisions for you. And I realized like this anxious like really like stressed out, Steve was making all of the decisions. He was making really bad decisions for me. And so we worked on some like some stuff to just quell the noise, to get, get back to a source, a point of truth in my life, to understand whether I was making good decisions. And I still use that today. Like when I find that anxiety is too much, it's just a simple exercise of creating a, a couple columns and saying in the one column you write down, all of the things that are bothering you. I'm not good enough. I'm not producing well enough. I'm not a good provider. Whatever that naysayer voice is in your life, you write that down. And then you write in the next column, how much out of 10 do you believe this is true? And then you give it a score. Nine out of 10, 10 out of 10, this is definitely true. And then the next column, you have to write points to motivate that truth. It's true because of it. And you'll find like it's really difficult to find points to motivate that. And then you know, you have to then in the next column write points to sort of oppose that. And then you write that. And you find like this list of opposition is like really long very quickly. And then at the end, you say like now rescore that how much do you believe that this is true? And the score drops dramatically. And it's because what lives in your head is much worse or much uglier than what lives in reality. And when you suddenly bring it into reality and you, you're forced to confront it, it's way way less worse than you think it is and it's far more manageable than you than you thought it was and and so you've got to put these thoughts out into the real world and you've got to let them live in the sunlight and if they do live in the sunlight then you can take action but while they live in your head you can't take action and they just suck for you they're like they, they're the worst score that you can give them i really like that technique and and it reminds me what you said there actually like most people worry about like 90 percent of the things you worry about actually never end up happening. Yeah. And it's so crazy because all of us will like worry about stuff and we're like, oh my God, what about this? And what about that? And 90% of that stuff never, ever happens. And I always like remember reading that. I'm like, okay, cool. Is this, is this something that's never going to happen? Should I just like move on? And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting statistic. That's for sure. Yeah. I like it. If you think about like everything, every time I'm procrastinating, I know what I'm doing. I'm building a bigger problem than I think is, I think, I think there's a bigger problem than there actually is. And so it's the worst thing because what you start to do is you park stuff. You park two minute tasks that become 20 minute tasks, you know, and you, you avoid your mailbox and then you can see the subject line or the subjects from that person. And they definitely want feedback on this. I'm like, I just don't want to address it. it it's an area I'm not comfortable with. I don't know enough about it, blah, blah, blah. And it becomes this big thing. And then when you, when you eventually come on, you open your laptop and you're like, okay, let me just address this. And then you open the mail. Oh, it's two questions. Oh, I know this. 
oh, oh actually so and so will know this is not even for me like and then you, and you give it to the right person to solve and it's like it's like it's so crazy how you do that but it, it really is like it's a habit of saying okay just assess it just face up to it and just deal with it because it, it's definitely like you said it's definitely way way less worse than than what's in your head <laughs> totally so you have a new show now steven show and you say building better lives by embracing challenges i explore the art of building a better life by doing hard things and conquering challenges um i'm always like admired I always admire guys like yourself that are that are taking big risks in life that are that are doing new things. Um, tell me about Stephen Show. So, well, I mean, you know the backstory, but I'll just tell the backstory is that um, you know you and I started working together on some coaching, and um, and we we started to map out some things like what does the future version of me look like, and what is Steve forty five version going to be doing, and what is that like how are we going to move towards that and one of the things was to to sort of create three things like what are three things that we really wanted to go after and the podcast was something that lived in the back of my head every time i listened to a podcast i'm like i could do that and every time i heard someone's like geez i'd really like to talk to people about that and geez what a great opportunity to learn and these things and i was like okay i can do this you know i, I really can do this but it just wasn't coming forward and so we said okay let's put a date to this thing let's set a goal on it and let's make this thing happen. And it was one of the best decisions I made. And like the first 10 episodes have been like really finding a voice for it. And it was just like, okay, let's go out there. Let's not worry too much around, you know, like the bigger stuff of how many you follows it will have and what it's going to be, but let's just follow, let's just get the episodes out and let's build the content and the rest will come from there. And it's, that's how it started. And, and it, it is, that is like, I have access to a great network of people in Lisbon. And um, yeah, I'm very fortunate enough to like be surrounded by a lot of founders who are doing incredible things or have done incredible things. And I thought that their stories would be really, um, really interesting to sort of hear about because I think that they apply to not only starting own businesses, but to life. And I, I think that that's something that we can always find a way to apply the lessons that people are doing. So whether you want to be an entrepreneur, or a founder, or you want to be like a really great professional or build your own life, I think there's a lot of lessons around grit, around just doing things, around not worrying too much about the outcome, but worry, focusing more on the input and, you know, th this type of mentality that you have to build for yourself to be successful in life. And so that's, that's what it is. And it's been great for me in terms of my personal journey and my personal learning is like, what I'm very, you know, very clearly starting to understand about myself is that I'm actually a better employee than I am an entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur is like always like the, the, the buzzword and it's the thing and that's where the money is. But what I realized, like if I had far be better success and most people have far better success as a professional is building companies from the inside or being part of teams or collaborating with that stuff. And so it's, it's giving me that. I'm like, okay, these things apply. So you can do both and how do I apply it? And so the journey for me has been incredible just from some of the conversations that I've had. And I walk away from everyone thinking, well, I really learned quite a lot today. So it, it's been really good. It's amazing what you can learn from actually like sitting down and having a deep conversation with somebody. I know Joe Rogan, he always says that he's like, I mean, he encourages everyone almost to start a podcast because he also says that like, people just don't sit down these days and, and like have long conversations. You know, you, you generally like your, your WhatsApp somebody and it's probably written or it's an audio message. Um, you're not necessarily even calling people and you're almost not really ever sitting down, especially one-on-one, -on -one. you know, like a group setting is more difficult. You can get cool things out of it for sure, but it, it takes a while to kind of sort out those group dynamics. But the amount you can learn from actually sitting across the table to, uh, from somebody is, is pretty phenomenal. Yeah, I think um, communication is complex and things like WhatsApp and email and text, Instagram, whatever it is, there's, they try to simplify the complexity of how we talk to each other as human beings. There's a lot in terms of body language. There's a lot in terms of context. and um, and I think that like this, this connection with people is like really where we learn or where we breed higher thinking. 
And so I find like even like social media tries to strip down things to a black or white version of something and then wants everyone to form a side and make an opinion. But when you talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, you, you get to the deeper level of meaning and understanding. And I think that that for me is what the podcast has been great for. And I, I always try to tell this to people, like even salespeople, I, I go back, but this is my best thing. Is like, you can't close a deal over email as well as you can close it in person. And when you sit in front of someone and you shake their hand and you make a commitment to them, you're going to do your best to deliver on that commitment. And they're going to do their best to deliver on their commitment. And that's a, like a really good place to be. And when you ask your wife to marry you, you don't send her an email. You, you sit down in front of your wife and you have a conversation about getting married and you build up to this moment and you say, will you marry me in person? It's not something you do over WhatsApp. And it's like the depth of how we need to communicate or, or what we shouldn't try to simplify. And I think that that's, that's really important. And we, we're losing some of that. And I, like, it's just even me in my workplace says that I'm far better in the office connecting people and we get more done over the water cooler conversations than we do over Slack, WhatsApp, or email. Like that's what really moves people. And so it's, a, it's an aspect of communication that we need to pay attention to and we need to really develop and work on is like face-to-face -face conversation. I feel like I'm extremely similar to you in that regard, whereby I am so much more convincing when I'm in person than almost when I'm online, you know what I mean? Like, and I, and I don't mean that, like, I just mean that in like a, my energy is, is different. You know, you, you'll pick up a different vibe from me when you see me. And, you know, it's the same, obviously, with you. And just that, yeah, you, you can just get such better results by um, experiencing somebody in person. It reminded me of one of the guests we had on our podcast. He always said, your energy speaks before you do. And, and you, can, you can sense that with people, hey, like, like someone like yourself, who's a high energy guy, um, who's positive. Uh, will walk into a room, you know, because you you walk up straight, you have your shoulders back, you generally got a smile on your face, and they're like, ah, I want to be around this guy. But you yeah. can also, and, and they haven't even spoken to you; they've just seen you, you know. And that's because your energy speaks before you do. And um, you, the opposite is true as well. For some people, they can walk in and they can be like looking on their phone and have their shoulders sort of slouched, and you know, um, and you're like, okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go speak to Steve there in the corner rather than this person. And it's it's really an important part of communication is being conscious of your own energy and mannerisms and body language. But it changes you too. Like if you smile, you will feel happier. Like that will happen. And you can, you can, even if you're feeling shit, you can short, like, what's it like short circuit or like, you know, sort of jumpstart your own energy level. So like before you phone someone, like before you phone someone that you hate phoning, try smiling and starting that conversation and try to speak to them only by smiling and it becomes like infectious like it changes the tone like when you write an email like well especially me is like like even my like my like my grammar and my punctuation is terrible so like what i'm sending and what they're reading and the mood that they're reading that in has nothing to do with the way that i sent it or the way that i wanted to convey it unless like i'm like pissed off about my electricity bill or something but the, the thing is that when you smile or when you create your sort of false image, it becomes your image and then the energy sort of goes from there and then it attracts more like that. So the happy people will come to you. Okay, he's happy. So happy's going to come over here and then they're sad and they're sad. Like, and that's, you see that in office dynamics too. It's like all the grumpy, like miserable people always end up, end up together and all the like happy, like I'm not getting involved in that. They always end up together because they're kind of like, they're like magnetized towards each, towards each other. So you can make a decision like, okay, yeah, like things are not great at the office. Things are not going well, but like these are things that I can control. I can control how I feel. I can control my motivation. I can control, you know, like so many aspects of this and I can make those decisions for myself and you, your energy will completely change. It uh, reminds me like you could be, you know, having a, a fight with your wife and you're like super like angry with her, you know, and then 
your daughter walks in the room and actually you still want to be angry, right? Because you, you know, you don't want to let up on your wife, right? But your daughter walks into the room and she's just giggling and smiling and like, daddy, daddy. And then you're like, you're like, okay, well, I've got to be nice. You know, I can't let her because I'm not angry with her sort of thing. And it's so true. Like her energy and her smile, like makes you smile and it is infectious and we must be conscious of this. I think it's, yeah. a, it's a really cool thing to remember. Yeah, I just to add to that, like, you know, my wife and I've had some rippers, you know, like bad arguments and my daughter will sort of not like it, you know, she, like we try not to fight in front of kids, but stuff happens, we're adults and it's life. And so my daughter gets upset and she's like, whoa, 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 everyone calm down. She's like four, she's like, calm down. But she's normally telling dad to calm down, which irritates me even more. It's like, dad, calm down. And so it drives me crazy. But what's really important is that she also sees that we are able to make up. And that's something that we, like conflict is going to happen. And you have the power to change the energy or your approach to these things. Sometimes the little voice saying calm down is a good reset button to say, okay, we've let the energy kind of get away from us and this is not ideal. So we've learned to kind of just take a breath and like step back. But then really important following that is like, it's cool. Give each other a hug. Make sure that the makeup is as visible as the, the conflict. They say that the best thing you can do for, or generally for your daughter, but I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, for your son as well, for them to have good relationships with their, you know, like, um, say their future relationships, like if they're in a, you know, become a couple eventually, like is to see how the dad treats the mom. And I think that's something like we all need to be conscious of as parents, you know, like how we treat each other, um, is what our kids will kind of end up being like, you know what I mean? So you guys, like you said, you might have this big fight, but then you resolve it. And that's what they're going to do in the future. You know, they'll be like, okay, it's actually okay. But you, cause you can sort this fight out in the future. Um, but then, you know, if you had to go the opposite way and just like carry on screaming at your wife and then like slam the door and like, you know, whatever, see you later, then you're just setting such a bad example for your kids. So we've got to be really conscious of, of how we are in front of them. Yeah. I think, Definitely daughters, but sons too. You know, I think that how your mom is willing to be treated and how she treats, you know, your dad, but also like how your dad treats mom. Like I think that that, <clears throat> that respect is that must always always be there. And I think stuff is going to get heated. you two adults with opinions and a view of the world, and that's a good thing. And you're going to debate those things. And then you're also going to have your boundaries that you need to defend. And uh, provided that there's, it's not physical and it's not abusive and it is leads to some sort of constructive work towards peace, which Jordan Peterson says is that we're both working for peace all the time and you want the best version of that. And sometimes you have to go through a bit of like turmoil to get there. But the, the, the objective that we want is like really good. And I think your kids need to see that. I mean, I'm not an expert. My, my daughter's four, you know, my son's turning two, like, but I just know, like, I know, like, how happy that make, would have made me feel to see that stability in a home. Um, you know, my, my, um, my wife's family is like a very traditional family. And, um, and I can see, like, the confidence my wife has as a person coming from a home like that. Like, the, the rules of engagement were very clearly defined. <clears throat> you can fight. You can shout. You know, you cannot get physical. And, and you need to sort of structure your language well. Like these were kind of like the basis, the essence of it. So, and I see that the way that my wife's family deals with conflict is way better than my family. And my family tends to sort of like, we, we don't like face it straight on. We worry about hurting feelings. We don't kind of like, and then we kind of like fester or harbor stuff that we're not openly talking about. And whereas that family dynamic is very much like, I mean, even when they do it, it's a big joke in the family. Like if they start having like a little bit of a bicker in the house, like I, I panic, like I don't know what to do. Like I kind of want to leave the room. And so that, that conflict for me is like, it's a difficult one to face, but they are so like natural and within five minutes, cool. But 
you know, they're breaking bread again. Everything is cool. They've all said their piece and they've kind of moved on and it's done. That point is completely killed. There's no more talking about it for hours afterwards. And that for me is like something that's really important. I think that, um, you, you know, just creating an environment where your kids know that they can speak up and they can challenge ideas and they can challenge opinions and you can have an argument about it. But as long as you sort of work for peace, it'll be okay. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, just having that sort of like family structure, I think, um, is so important, you know, for the overall development of, of our kids. Um, so, yeah, but I just wanted to find out what is, uh, what is the goal with your, your podcast? Like, where do you kind of see it going? So I'm kind of transitioning now because I'm having to do a lot of the production myself now. So like, it's just, <clears throat> the idea was that I wanted to build this podcast and I'm going to monetize it and then it's going to be cool, you know? And like, so I've invested some cash into it. I'm like, okay, I have to sort of rework some things and and make this more cost effective. So I'm producing a lot more of it for me, uh, myself. So to reduce costs, but the long term of it is that I want to build a platform that really helps people find their way that gives them the courage to, to take that next step to, you know, sort of like eliminate what's holding them back off of the experience of others. You know, like the experience of others is like a shortcut to a lot of stuff for us that so that if you can plug into that and you can have, I was very fortunate. I had great mentors and if I can make mentors available through lots of different stories, I think more people are inclined to take those challenging steps. And it doesn't have to be an entrepreneurial route. It can just be in their job. It can be starting that side hustle. It can be losing 20 kilos, like well, if it's 20 kilos to lose, whatever, losing weight. Uh, but the point is that you will have something that you can plug into that will inspire you to do that thing, to eliminate the obstacles or to be honest about the obstacles that are in front of you. So, you know, short term is, build an audience for it long term is to make it like a significant voice that people can really re rely on and i think that the reward on it is already coming like i get messages from people friends and family connecting and saying you know that episode really resonated with me or that was so helpful i'm going through this like really rough time and i really needed to hear that and that for me says okay the voice that i'm creating in this is going in the right direction those are the best messages to receive hey you like you never really know who's who's listening to your podcast. Like sometimes you just get this random message from, you know, probably from a friend, you know, or or even sometimes from people you don't know, but, and, and you're like, wow, I didn't even know you listened to the podcast, you know, and they'll be, and, and you're like, cool, this is why I'm doing it. You know, even if it's like one message per podcast, that's all it takes, you know, like if we imagine if everyone kind of like did that, we all could do one thing, you know, once a week where, it resonated with somebody and helped somebody. It would, uh, it would just make the world a, yeah, a greater place to live, a more rich place, I think. And you, like, you really appreciate it. Like, it's a long time to listen to a podcast. Like, people are taking time to do it. It's not like a, <clears throat> a quick flip through a reel. And so when someone says, "Oh, I, I listened to this podcast," I'm like, it was like really good. I'm like, "Oh, you spent an hour of your time listening to something that you know, like it. It really is." It's a great feeling. So I really love that. And again, like the most random stuff, like I'm busy playing paddle last Sunday and, you know, um, my wife's cousin said, oh yeah, I had a friend. He asked me if I know you because he listens to your podcast. And I'm like, this is like completely unrelated, like completely, but it was just like amazing. It's like, I really love it. Yeah, that's super cool, but well, well, but I, I mean, I know you're going to make a success of it. You, you've done that pretty much with everything in your life. So, so really excited, excited for you. So what, what else um, are you like most excited about uh, in the future and, and that you have coming up? So I think um, I want to start plugging more into longevity and longevity is a, it's a complex one because the payout is very far down, down the road and it's very hard to track because it doesn't, the effort that you put in doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome will be X in terms of more financially stable or whatever. So it's, it's a difficult one. And I think, <clears throat> but it's about creating awareness in the now and giving you the probability of a better outcome down in future in life. And I think that for me is a big thing to start solving for. We, um, we, we live like really 
challenging lives at the moment. They are more stressful. There's a higher expectation on us. Our villages are breaking down. Um, the support that we used to be able to rely on for in terms of raising our children isn't the same. Uh, there's, a, like, there's a lot of noise out there as well that you're having to sort of navigate every single day. So there's there's this like this world that we're living in and just plugging into the basics for longevity, like how we eat, how we exercise, uh, sort of how we reward ourselves, um, you know, how we sort of de-stress, all of these aspects is like, you've got to create a program around these things that you can consistently repeat. And what does tracking that look like? And what are the things that you need to plug in that will give you the best possible outcome in the future? Like, I don't want you to go and spend $2 million a year on longevity. I don't think you have to do that. But you, there are some basics that you can do every single day. And so I want to create the platforms that help people do that. So whether it's a facility where you come in and you do your cold plunge and your sauna, um, whether it's an app that you can plug in all of your sort of your metrics from everything from your VO2 max. Uh, so how good is your cardiovascular health? How good is your body composition? How good is your nutrition? All of these aspects now need to come to end. I think there's so many sort of pockets of this everywhere. It's about bringing all of these together that builds a score for you that will show you over time that you're on the right track. It's going to be okay. You should increase your health span. Or if something really bad happens to you from a health perspective, you're going to have a great platform to start fixing that problem. And, and that's something that I want to start solving for. I think we're living in like such exciting times when it comes to what we can actually do and achieve and change and track when it comes to health that yeah man it's uh yeah it's a really cool time to to be here so where can people get in touch with you if they want to find out more about you um and yeah just drop you a message or listen to your show so my easiest one is um uh, you know uh, Stephen murray on linkedin um so it's uh it's an easy one to follow or you can send me an email at uh, incubate pro incubate pro at gmail.com um, and, uh, yeah, I'm very happy. So like you can find me there or uh, South African Steve on Instagram. So any of those, I uh, sort of are very active on and, uh, happy to sort of help and chat to anyone. Okay. That's awesome. Man. And, and my last question is what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I'm going to go back to, um, being authentic. I think that, uh, it's just being yourself and, making the best version of yourself every single day. And I think that humans, humans are great at evolving and kind of developing consistently. And you can't stagnate. You have to keep pushing yourself. And so ridiculously human is getting to the essence of that constant evolution, constant development, and constant authenticity. That's awesome, bud. Man, I just wanted to say thanks so much for coming on the show. It's so interesting when I think back at like, how we even know each other. Like we kind of, I think we've only met in person once, but, and almost like extremely briefly, you know, at a dinner and, but, but you, you like are friends with sort of my, my bunch of friends from school, or we have like guys that have joined, joined forces and in the same group now. And, you know, we were talking about like connecting online as opposed to in person. And I feel like you know, most of our relationship is online, you know, and, and I definitely feel like, like I'm your, I'm your brother and you're my brother. And I can't wait to actually feel that energy in person when, when I eventually move to, to Portugal and just to spend time with you, you know, because you are like the most authentic guy ever. Um, you, we all hold you in like high regard and, um, just listening to you speak now, you know, and to hear parts of your story um, is really kind of like motivating, but, and, um, I can see why people gravitate towards you, you know, as, as a person, uh, we, we've, we, I mean, we've hardly touched on any of your story really, you know, there, there's just like, there's so much there, but, uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show, bud. And, um, I just, yeah, I really wish you all the best in, in everything. And, you know, this is just the beginning for you and me, which is, which is also super cool. Yeah, I, I, like I, I definitely echo that. And we we met at a, a wedding and at a dinner. Ah, the wedding, yes. And, um, yeah, there was a wedding and a dinner, and uh, enough of meetings for me to remember which are those two events. 
but uh, yeah, I've always like I followed your story too, and I, so like yeah, I really appreciate you you sort of extending the offer for me to be on your show. It, it really is an honor. And I, I mean that sincerely, and um, and more than that, like yeah, when you get here, like that physical connection to say, here's a hug, bro. I've uh, I've loved our journey together. Um, you've done incredible things for me in terms of opening me up to who I am. And um, you've created a, a really good sort of working foundation for me to start understanding more about myself. So yeah, this relationship has been incredible. Your podcast is great. It really is an inspiration for me. And, um, and I, yeah, I thank you very much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure, buddy. Thank you, bud.